Hey everybody, good evening. It's uh, Chris Payne here from the class of 87. Glad to see you guys again. It's been a while since I was on. I'm here with my cohort and partner in crime, uh, class of 86, Steve Rodriguez. We're gonna have a great show tonight. This is the show that we actually uh, uh, created the whole Facebook page for. Glad to see you guys. And so we're gonna have a great show. I'm here with my cohort and partner in crime, uh, class of 86, Steve Rodriguez. We're gonna have a great show tonight. This is the show that we actually uh, uh, created the whole Still there, Chris? You can go. We're good. Yeah, I'm here still. Anyway, it looks like we're having some technical difficulties, two old men farting around here. Uh, but anyway, so just want to remind you guys that we're the Bayshore Christian uh, alumni unofficial page. Everything we do saying here, here is purely our own and not to be uh, construed as representative of the school in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we do this purely for fun, for our enjoyment, and for your enjoyment as well. At any rate, I'm going to introduce uh, Steve Rodriguez. How's it going, Steve? Glad to be here, my friend. How are you doing? Doing great. Staying busy as ever, but I'm glad to be back on the podcast. Yeah, it's been uh, close to six months for us, right? I mean, the last time you and I did something together, I think, was the Todd Brandenburg episode. Uh, then we had the Jim Brown episode with Reggie Sanford. Um, and you've just been, you've been busy. You're a capitalist entrepreneur. You got a bed and breakfast. <laughs> bed and breakfast, restaurant, you're buying property. So the podcast, we're in season two. It's going to be hard to have you for more than just tonight uh, because of how busy you are. And we're almost wrapped up. We've produced a lot of content over the last year for the alumni to enjoy. Nothing bigger than what we have tonight, right? Yeah. Well, you know, they say, Steve, a fool is soon departed from his money. So <laughs> we'll see how all this happens. Adventurism goes. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so tonight we got well, anyway, it's, Yeah. It's, it's great to be back. I tell you, man, it's good to see you again. Um, I've missed being on the podcast, but uh, being as busy as I have, it just hasn't been, you know, been possible. But tonight's going to be great, Steve. I think this is what we've created this for, right? That's exactly right. That COVID Friday night, sitting at home, doing absolutely nothing during a lockdown, watching the Hillsborough County Hoops Facebook Live count down the top 25 players of every major high school in the city of Tampa. And you and I are watching at nine o'clock on Friday night, the base Christian list. And we're saying, not only is the, the, the list not as good as what we can do, but we can do a whole podcast that can cover all this week after week. And so, yes, this is what prompted us doing all this was a top 25 all-time team. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. We've had, we've had a lot of fun, though, with the top 10 teams of all time, top 10 games of all time, most people moments. Uh, I'll go behind the moment. We'll stick out probably forever in all of our hearts and minds. Um, but just a lot of a lot of great talk, a lot of great friendship. And uh, speaking of friendship, I want to thank everybody that made it to the, uh, the reunion weekend out at uh, Fabulous Fish Camp and also the next night at Carmine's. Uh, we had a great time, got to see a lot of old friends, and got to see some new faces of people that I'd heard of, but I'd never really met in person. Uh, one of them being, of course, Bo Heinley. <laughs> what an awesome guy. So, such a pleasure to meet him and just to reconnect with all my old friends as well. So thank you guys for coming out, and thank Coach Herman, uh, Coach Volpe, and Coach Sam Lanier for coming out as well. It's an awesome, awesome time. Yeah, what a great weekend. I wish I had been able to attend. I mean, I was I was planning it with you for months, and then, of course, my wife got COVID. It's a you know, it's a, it's a horrible uh, disease, this pandemic. And we certainly want to send out our prayers to Mike Blocker. Uh, Mike uh, has come down with COVID. All of his family got it, but Mike's got it pretty bad. He went in the hospital today. So uh, all of you Faith Warrior alumni out there and those watching this episode, and of course, we'll post it on Facebook. Please make sure that you're putting Mike Blocker in your prayers. He really needs it at this time. To be have to be hospitalized, it, it's certainly serious. So uh, let's keep him in your prayers um, so yeah, missed that weekend, but what a great weekend, 35 to 40 alumni getting together at your place at, at uh, Carmine's the next day with Coach Valdez, um, and it's led, it, it led to the return of Kelvin Daniels, who people have not seen for over 30 years, and, <laughs> and, and, and Andre Stevenson, who people had also not seen for over 30 years, right. two wonderful gentlemen, unbelievably professionally accomplished, whether it's Lockheed Martin for Kelvin, and uh, uh, Andre is a international big wig with Merck Laboratories. So uh, unbelievable to see those guys for everyone who got to 
that weekend because nobody had seen him in 30 years. Right. No, absolutely. Uh, absolutely wonderful. I got to tell you, though, as much as, as much as I enjoyed seeing those guys, I think the highlight for me was seeing Kevin Noriega. Noriega. <laughs> <laughs> Always loved that guy growing up and everything in high school, and he's still just as personable and as funny as ever. So, yeah. Great and seeing all Kevin. those guys. Love you, Kevin Noriega. <laughs> I mean, the number of Noriega stories that we have and have not shared on this show are, you know, obviously uh, <laughs> legendary in Bayshore lore. Uh, so, yeah, oh. great that he got to come back. And it was a surprise. I mean, we were able to keep it from a lot of people until the last minute. So that was really exciting as well. Great alumni. Oh, yeah. With him. yeah, I didn't know until the last minute. In fact, uh, Blocker said, oh, Noriega's be here in five minutes. I'm like, oh, you're BSing me. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't dream at all, you know. You're like, no, seriously, no, seriously. Oh, bull, you spit. And uh, sure enough, man, five, five minutes later, Noriega walked in. Man, it was so exciting. I, I mean, just to have Noriega in the room, and like you said, Coach Valdez and Coach yeah. Sam together uh, in that way, uh, you know, as friends in that way in so many years, that was unbelievable as well. Coach Wolpe you know, is another uh, uh, gentleman who had such an impact on – Bayshore graduates uh, and to get to see him as well. All of that was really great for those who could attend. Uh, so we had Kelvin on a podcast. We had this big alumni event. Jim Brown from uh, the class of 81 had a big event at Armature Works in, uh, in downtown Tampa. Um, so lots of events throughout the month of July leading up to tonight, which has been uh, something we've been working towards for over a year. And that's the Bayshore Christian top 25 all-time team. Tell us a little bit what we're gonna expect tonight, Chris. Uh, well, we've got a lot of diversity here. The, the team spans the 70s through the 2010s and even into 2020. Uh, not to give too much away there, but I think some of this is already kind of expected. Um, Steve and I put a lot of heart and soul into this. We spent the last year, and specifically the last six weeks, really researching every base for team, with their accomplishments, their key players, uh, how these players stack up against other key players and other, you know, in other scenarios and other eras, uh, per se. Uh, schedule toughness. Uh, Stephen came up with some criteria that we had, that we all kind of follow followed along with to uh, to choose this, these 25. Uh, it wasn't just Steve and I. There were several players and coaches that were also involved in our decision making. Uh, so this this, this wasn't done in a vacuum. It was just simply Stephen Chris's favorite 25. No, this is honestly God probably the best 25 players uh, that you'll ever find. I, I I dare anyone to make a better list. Um, but having said that, uh, Steve, you want to go over some of the criteria? <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely perfect description because we spent over a year. At first, uh, I didn't want to do it because I was afraid everybody get mad at us. And then you kept talking me into it. Cry havoc. Uh, let's slip the dogs of war. Let's go to battle. Let's go to. <laughs> so, uh, so eventually got talked into it. And then we thought it needed to be one list. I mean, Chris and I are going to on Facebook post who we thought should have been from our list, like who could have, who we thought could have been on there. There was six or seven, maybe eight guys that were unanimous. They are more than that. Well, there was eight unanimous. I think there was, yeah, there was 14 or 15 that we all agreed upon. So that that's correct. Um, I think there was eight that were like first ballot unanimous. Uh, and then we, we worked from there and we spent time getting videotape. We've read every freaking box score all the way back to 1976 that is available publicly. We scoured scrapbooks. We interviewed players. We talked to coaches. One of the four people that helped us, beside you and I, is a coach from the 2000s. And, and to remember what we've said many times, not only did you and I play there in the mid-80s, we coached there in the 90s. You coached there in the 2000s. The Broderick Day era, which we just concluded over 10 years of success, is completely documented on maxpreps.com, along with videos on Broderick's YouTube page. So we evaluated every component, every data point possible for over a 40 years of Bayshore dominance. So like you said, uh, you can you know, tinker around the margins, but this is as close as you're going to get. To, to the best 25 players in school history, a school that matters. I mean, when you're talking about Lockheed Martin and Merck Laboratories, when you're talking about Division I basketball players, you're talking about academics, you're talking about dominance in basketball, it doesn't come close. So we're very happy to bring our alma mater's best 25 list here tonight. 
And and yeah, about the criteria, you already mentioned it. There's like 20 categories. You can go online and see the criteria. I test matters. Some people are going to say, well, how did that guy made it? He only averaged 15 points. Well, yeah, well, he, he shot back in the 80s. There was no three-point line. How did that guy make it? Well, it was the eye contest. He scored a double-double when he played public high schools, class 4A and higher. Uh, how, how come that guy did not make it? He scored 30 a game. Well, you played Tampa Bay Adventist and Brandon Academy in every game. That doesn't really count. So there's a lot of variables that are weighed, and you and I did it for every freaking player on this list. The ones that did not make it, we evaluated, and I'm um, very happy with uh, you know what uh, each of us came up with. I have one more thing. I, I want you to say it if you want to, but I did want to compare the bias. Any bias between the decades has some underlying reasons. And I wanted to mention those before we got started. Did you want to mention it? Or you want me to go ahead and mention it? Well, certainly. I mean, I just will leave off just briefly and mention that you know you have to really look at the overall um, uh, success. Of, of, the, of the decade, of the era, um, of the teams. Uh, you'll note that from the uh, late 70s to 2000, there were more district titles won in that era than there was in 2001 or 2021. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the 90s, for example, <laughs> it's been said, and I don't know if this is true or not, I didn't actually like facts, you know, work this out, but it's been said that uh, we went 157 and one in, uh, in conference games. Uh, that's pretty remarkable for a ten for a decade long run. Uh, I dare say that anybody from 2000 to 2021 can make that kind of remark. There's an um, animal in the background. Is that your cat? Yeah, it's my cat. <laughs> <laughs> Nala. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. No. So I mean, you know, if you want to take that over speed, absolutely. But you know, people need to keep in mind that. Uh, you know, the, 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 the teams in the late 80s and early 90s were all-star teams. You know, I mean, they were heavy, heavy laden. We had to keep, we had to leave people off the list because of the fact that some of those teams were so uh, talent heavy, you know. Uh, so people need to realize that as well. You know, I mean, if you're a, a leading scorer on a team that goes 6 and 12, you know, that's not going to weigh as heavy as, as if you're on a team that's, you know, 34 and 3 and goes to the final four, you exactly. know. Um, so there's you know, a lot of different criteria we had to look at to try to make these decisions. Um, Steve, do you want to extend on that a little bit more? No, you covered it. I mean, if you're one of the greatest players in school history, your team did not go six and 12. Your performance should have helped lift your teammates to a better season. Um, and like you already said, more final fours in the 20th century versus the 21st century, more district titles in the 20th century than there was in the 21st century, more 20 win seasons, more 30 win seasons. So the list, the, the 2000s, the 21st century had four losing seasons. The only losing season since Herman Valdez arrived in the 20th century, they went to the final four. So it's just, so there's, there's players from every decade, every team, every champion's got a player on this list. But if there, there, there is no bias in how we measured it, but if there is a, more players from one decade or from the other, there's a reason. Those players destroyed the opposition that was in front of them. And so that, that was, the, that you pointed it out perfectly. And that's, that's just what I would share uh, in addition. So I think we're ready to get started. Yeah, let's go. Let's knock this out. The top 25 all time players in Bayshore history. Uh, Steve, I think it's you to start off with. And let's remind people too, the first 18 that we're going to mention are not really in any particular order, okay? Uh, they're just 18 of the top 25 guys that we found. The final seven will be in somewhat of a particular order. They're kind of like our seven-man first team, so to speak. But these first 18 guys, again, they're not in any particular order, okay? Just remind you about that. Uh, Steve, I think you're up first with Reggie Sanford. Yeah, did you want to mention, though, because I think it's on your list, uh, the five guys – one of the criteria is you had to graduate from Bayshore. And oh, absolutely. There are, there are five guys that are so good that had they graduated from the school, they would have kicked off five guys on the list. Uh, did you want to go ahead and mention that first? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So you five guys, and you probably know who you are. If you were on the bubble, you need to be sending these guys thank you notes, thank you letters, okay? Because right. if it wasn't for these guys, you wouldn't be on the list. <laughs> um, but I'm going to start off with uh, uh, 
one of our big men that didn't quite make it, he didn't graduate from Bayshore. And one of the requirements to be on the list is you had to be a Bayshore alum. You had to graduate from Bayshore. Um, you know, you can't just have played there for a couple of years. If you graduate from Bayshore else, then go be on their top 25 list. You know what right, I mean? Right. Um, yeah, so the first guy I want to mention is Tree White. Uh, six foot ten, Tree White played in, um, played in the Jonathan Johnson era. Steve, what do you want to say about Tree? Yeah, Tree was great. Um, he had a Final Four in the 19, with the 1994 team on the Jonathan Johnson team. Uh, we're getting a lot of his clips that are going to be posting over the next several months because Bo Heinley's dad was kind enough to get us 1993 and 1994 uh, video game highlights. Uh, so you'll get to see a lot more of Tree, those memories from the Tree days. Uh, Tree was great with Duncan. He rejected shots into next week and was a oh great – he was a great Bayshore player. Uh, had he graduated, he would have knocked somebody off this list. Uh, graduated from Bayshore, he would have knocked somebody off this list for sure. Oh, yeah. He could, he could block some shots, man. He would send it in the next week for sure. Oh, man. That was his forte. No doubt about it. Uh, so, again, Tree White there. Another guy I want to mention real quick is Kenny Brown. Steve, what do you know about Kenny Brown? Kenny Brown is one of those whatever became of question mark stories. You have a TV show from the 80s, whatever became of. Kenny Brown's junior or junior year, which was Valdez's first year, I think. So I want to say 1982, 83, Coach Valdez. Uh, he was probably the best, if not one of the best players on the team. When you talk to the original gangsters, Harville, Edwards, those guys, Kenny Brown was a real deal. He was in the Tampa Tribune as being one of our prime players. Again, remember back then, this was walk it up basketball, no three-point line. The scores are in the 40s and 50s. Somebody averaging 14 points a game is basically averaging 33% of your offense. Kenny Brown was a double-double guy. He could dunk at 6'1 or 6'2. Had that mean streak that made Bayshore original gangsters what they were. Uh, he moved to Texas uh, for his senior year that next year. A lot of people think if he'd have been on that 84 Final Four team, he was the difference maker. I don't know you're going to stop Chris Corciani, as Herman Valdez said. But Kenny Brown... Um, as he, if he graduates from Bayshore, he knocks another guy off the list. He was that good. Absolutely. So I would consider those two guys top 25 guys. These next three guys, I would consider them top 10. And one of them maybe, maybe would, have, would have pushed into the top seven. Um, but I'm going to go with our next guy on the list. Uh, played on the 2000-2001 uh, Final Four team. Transferred to Gaither High School uh, for a senior year. Big mistake. Uh, Brandon Harrison. Steve, what do you know about Brandon Harrison? Well, you know, I um, at that time I was coaching high school basketball, and I and I matched up against Bayshore, those teams, those Dibble uh, Renaissance team, and that Final Four team twice, and we got the snot kicked out of us like you'd never seen. Brandon Harrison was a stud. His parents were famous uh, athletes. Uh, I don't remember if it was professional or at Florida State, but they had gone to Tampa Catholic. Uh, they were they were great, famous Tampa. Uh, at high school athletes and so he came from a uh, good stock and he was a great basketball player for Bayshore again a double double guy played on a final four team that won a district title and most importantly to me the Bay Conference title by beating Joe Finland and Tampa Prep at Tampa Prep but which we had not won the Bay Conference for like six or seven years at that point played with Jared Piazza Rollins a whole bunch of guys connect so for me Brandon Harrison's another guy that would probably knock off another guy if he had graduated from Bayshore, and there's no doubt that had he stayed at Bayshore, that team probably could have made another Final Four run. Him and Connect were that good, and had they stayed, could have produced another Final Four run. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they would have the Sweet 16 the next year anyway, and that was without those two. So those two definitely would have made, would have made a big difference. Yeah. Um, so next guy on the list, and you just mentioned them, in my opinion, is one of the – one of the best big men to ever play for Bayshore, uh, even though he's not that big. He's no. about six, he was probably about six foot three back in the day. And uh, I really like this guy because he could play every position on the floor. Didn't matter where he was at. Uh, he could post you up. He could dribble. He could pass. He could shoot. Uh, and that's Kyle Connect, one of my favorite players. Yeah, I mean, Connect had it all. And I wish he would reconsider. Hopefully his teammates will talk him into joining us when we talk about the 2001 Dibble Renaissance Final Four team because you already just said it all. Connect was one of the best big men, undersized big men, more of a stretch four, had guard skill, uh, was a great high school basketball player. I wish we would have kept him that last year. 
because he was really good. I understand the reasoning of leaving, though. I mean, these guys had their coach uh, removed. I mean, they sure made the wrong decision, in my view, of letting go the, the high school coach of the year who had just won 33 games and took him to the state final four. Uh, Tom Dibble, who had spent two decades at the school, I, I wish that had not happened. So those are reasons to leave. But had he stayed, um, he would have been a great contributor because he was a great high school basketball player. Yeah. And if you don't believe this, guys, check out the YouTube video of Kyle Connect dunking in the final four. Yeah. <laughs> it's it is it's awesome. a sight to see, I tell you what. It is awesome. <laughs> What's that? It is awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, it's something to see. Anyway, that leaves us with our last guy that, if he had not graduated, would have been top 10. And I dare say this guy may, may would have even broken into the top seven. And that's, of course, Andrew oh. Frazier, who went on to play for Tampa Prep after what they saw. Oh, well, Steve, what do you have to say about Holt Andrews? Absolutely. I mean, you're talking about Robin to Derek Smith's Batman. You're talking about a 20 point per game, six or seven assists, four or five steals, multiple rebounds. He played for Showtime, the Derek Smith era, 34 and two one year, uh, 32 and 33 and six, whatever it was the next year, went to the Final Four. I ironically, every Bayshore team, I think, eventually lost to the state champion. So even if we didn't make the championship game, our loss was to the eventual champion. Andrew Frazier earned his scholarship at Bayshore Christian. He was offered a ride at uh, Vanderbilt University, Power Five, SEC, from his academic and athletic performance at Bayshore Christian, summer before his senior year goes to Tampa Prep. We've talked about how that was almost a turning point between the two programs and Tampa Prep launched into what it is today, which is a which is a superpower in its own right. Um, and Andrick's departure helped that. So a lot of Bayshore old school guys like you and I are sitting around the bar saying, you know, we ain't too happy with his decision. But nonetheless, <laughs> you cannot take away from what him and Derek Smith produced. For two years, they were the greatest show on earth. And everyone in high school that wanted to watch a high school basketball game came to watch Bayshore Christian, thanks to those two guys. In my book, he, there's no doubt he's a top seven uh, you know, if, if he had stayed in the school. Uh, I agree completely. I mean, heck, I mean, after you left, you ended up being 2A class player of the year I mean, at Tampa yeah. Prep the following year. So just would have done uh, had he come back that last year for his senior year. Uh, yeah, you can make the argument, five, Chris. Five, um, you, what's that? You, you, can, you can make the argument, Chris, and sorry for interrupting, that had he re – now, now, Malone was in the middle of a historic run like Miami senior, four or five years state championships in a row. So, yes – it was going to be hard to break through. But if Andrick, Schrage, uh, Andrick Frazier is running the point for us on that 1994 Final Four team, you could make the argument that their pressure doesn't turn us over as much and, and our size helps win that game. That's how important he was. So, yeah, one of the greats and a great uh, worth a mention had they graduated guy to consider. Yeah, and a great guy, too. Uh, turned into a great guy as well. Um, so there you go. There you go. There's our five that had they graduated from Bayshore would probably be in the top 25. Um, definitely worth a mention here. Uh, you can't have Bayshore basketball without those guys, uh, even if they didn't graduate. Uh, okay. so, at the, so that's all we got for that for now. I think we're going to go ahead and start with our 25 uh, all-time Bayshore players. Uh, I think you're up first, Steve, with uh, Reggie Sanford. That's exactly right. Well, you just said it for me. Um, just as a reminder to everybody, this is not in order on purpose. As Chris said at the right. beginning, there's 18 random names, and that's because we want everybody to not, you know, they, they hear their name or they don't hear their name and they stop watching. We want to make sure that it was random. We're not, we're not putting people in order as who was the best. We are naming the top five, and we're naming two guys that could have fit the top five. Maybe they're six men. So those final seven are really the best of the best. No doubt about it. But these 18 are, are top 25 as well in no particular order. You already said it, Reggie Sanford, class of 1981. And I'll get my list of accolades out here and bring them up. Four-year starter, four-year letterman, all-conference 1980 and 81, honorable mention all-county 1981. These are on teams with losing records. Uh, honorable mention all-state 1981 off a team with a losing record and a scholarship to play basketball at Eckerd College. Uh, he played professionally in Brazil. Um, this is the pre-Empire days, pre-Coach pre Valdez. There was no one better 
than Reggie Sanford. I mean, Robinson Public High School was basically trying to get him to go over there and play when Herman was over there. You know the stories, you've said them before as well. Reggie is one of the top 25 greatest all-time Bayshore players. What do you think, Chris? Uh, I agree with everything you just said. I just want to mention one thing, and then and we mentioned it be probably before in the podcast, but the funniest or strange thing I ever saw was a newspaper article uh, in the Tampa Tribune that said, what would Reggie, what would Robinson be, be like if it had Reggie Sanford? <laughs> <laughs> right. that, doesn't, that doesn't have recruiting listed all over it. I don't know what it does. <laughs> right. And it also speaks so, how great Reggie was. That, that's what it does. Absolutely. Exactly. No, exactly right. Absolutely. Uh, one of the first and foremost greatest players of, of Bay Shore history. Yeah, the uh, first. Kind of, kind of led the way. Something to live up to for sure. Yeah. Uh, so the next player we have on the list is a, a, a friend favorite, a family favorite. Uh, I got to tell you, to be honest, and I just love this guy. Uh, he led the county in free throw shooting in 1985. He was all conference in 85. He was in Ottawa, Mitchell County in 1985. This guy, though, was a game day player, okay? He's one of those guys that maybe didn't shine in practice, but I tell you what, when the lights were brightest, this guy came out to play. In back-to-back -back seasons against 4A powerhouse Plant City, he hung 26 and 21 points. Now, one of those was in a loss, a very close loss, but the next season in 1985, they actually beat Plant City, who had the likes of John Bell, who played the University of Alabama, uh, a couple of other guys that played high at, at Division I schools, and truly just a huge upset on Bayshore's behalf. And that's why I love this guy. He was a member of the district champion team from the final, in the final four in 84, and the big conference championship, and that's John Harville. Uh, Steve, you want to expand a little more on John? Well, I mean, you said it all, and, and to add to it would just be repeating all the great stories from previous podcasts. I mean, John Arville's an original gangster. We know the story of how we all met him at that Brandon High game and, and his father, and he talked, right. talked to me about going to Bayshore, and he is an original. There is no separating Bayshore basketball from Coach Valdez. There's no separating Bayshore basketball from John Harville. That end of statement, he's an OG and, and just, you know, a great friend and, and very thankful that he made the list. Clearly, obviously, one of the. I think I got the next one. Uh, I believe you do. This one is a guy uh, that. Uh, yeah, sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. The, the next one is class of 1997. And if you knew the, the guy, you would say he's really out of from the 80s. He actually should be on the original gangster team. Because uh, if you go to the park and you're going to get in a, a street fight over a basketball game, there's only one guy I'm taking with me. And that's this one. This is Andrew Polito. <laughs> Polito. Andrew, uh, of course, Drew Polito is uh, Bayshore royalty. He comes from a uh, Coach Valdez bloodline. Let me get the stats out here real quick. Um, he played on back-to-back -back district champions in 96 and 97. One of the all-time greats. Here's some of the stats I got for him, and, and make sure to correct me or add if I miss something. All Bay Conference, 96-97. Honorable mention, All County, 1996. First team, All County, 3A, 2A, 1A, 1997. Top 10 in the county in assists. Average of double-double points and assists in 1997. Played on three district championship teams one state final four team, as we said, an OG styled player. And he played on, you know, uh, the Forgotten Kings. We call the 1997 team the Forgotten Kings because the team they lost to in the regional final, well-documented on previous podcasts, won the state title handedly. Bayshore lost in double overtime. If Bayshore wins that game, 26 of 49 free throws, whatever it was, uh, Bayshore probably wins its first state title in basketball. So the accolades for Polito are unmatched. He's one of the greats of all time. What do you got to say, Chris? The only thing I want to mention is that he was also a thousand point club member, a score of a thousand points in his career. And that was even though, and he was even gone for a year to uh, Jefferson, right. Jefferson High School. He did come back to graduate from Bayshore, so obviously he's a bump, and obviously he's deserved on this list. But uh, basically, in a two year period, he scored of a thousand points. Uh, he was on the varsity as a freshman in that 94 team. That's when they right. went to the final four, uh, but it didn't really get a lot of playing time. So in that era to score a thousand points in only two seasons is really quite impressive. And I tell you what, I mean, Steve said it all. 
But basically, this guy was ready to play every night, uh, gave his heart and soul every game. Heart and, and soul. And there's no one else you'd rather have in a, have in a street fight or at a basketball court uh, than Andrew Polito, for sure. That's right. Completely agree. I think you're up next. You got the next one. All right. So next on our list is a tall, lean, lanky guy. Uh, definitely understated. Uh, definitely overlooked. Uh, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet in your entire life. He was the stalwart of the last uh, great team of, of the 90s. He actually went into 2000-2001, and that's uh, Joe Rollins. Uh, just a phenomenal player. He played on a team that was very well-rounded, well-balanced with guys like Brandon Harrison, Jared Piazza, Kyle Kinect. So there you have, you have four guys on that team to lead the way, but it was Joe Rollins that actually stepped up and led the way, averaging almost 20 points a game. He was a uh, all Big Conference 2000, 2001, honorable mention all county in 2000, first team all county in 2001. He was top three in the scoring in Pillsbury County in 2001. Top 15 scoring in Hilton County in 2000. Uh, first team all state in 2001. All final four team 2001. Team MVP 2001. Uh, won district and Bay Conference titles in 2001. So, I mean, I could just go on and on and on uh, with accolades on this guy, but absolutely definitely overlooked, uh, specifically by colleges. Uh, definitely a guy that should have got a college scholarship that didn't get his, his, his due. Uh, but yeah, that's Joe Rollins. See, if you got anything to add for Joe Rollins? No, you hit it all. I mean, the colleges missed out on a great one. I mean, you read all the accolades. That team is one of the greats. I think we listed them number five or six all time on the top 10 teams episode. You might've had them a little bit higher or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you hit, you hit it all. Joseph Rollins is one of the greats and you know, he's, he's on one of the, he's on the top 25 greatest list. So am I next JJ? I think you're up. JJ Garnett. How, how do you how do you have a list without JJ Garnett? I mean, um, the the man, the young man at the time, the, the the player, All Bay Conference in 1990, second team All County 1990, top three in scoring in Hillsborough County in 1990. He was literally a for sure 20 to 25 point a game guy every single night. You laced up the shoes. He played on a team that won 19 straight games. They were the district champions. He had 27 points versus Robinson in a win, 30 points versus Jefferson, uh, signed uh, with Eastern Kentucky. Yeah, he signed with Eastern Kentucky. What's that? Game day player. Game day player. J.J. Garnett was one of the greats. He didn't just do all that his senior year. I mean, that's 89-90. He was part of that 88-89 team. It only went 18 and 10, but people forget – that 88-89 team upset class uh, 4A, number six ranked Leto. It was a really good basketball team. Didn't have a lot of perimeter scoring other than J.J. And J.J.'s jump shot his junior year wasn't as proficient as his senior year. He was more of a dribble drive, get to the uh, get to the middle of the lane, mid-range type of guy. Uh, so those two years of his high school career were unprecedented. He was one of the greats. And uh, he is now, is that the last, is that the last of the first five we've named? I think... We are now at yep. the first five players on the all-time Bayshore top 25 list. So great job just to restate. we got Reggie Sanford, John Arville, Andrew Polito, Joseph Rollins, and J.J. Garnett. That's a great start. Yeah. yeah. And let's not forget, J.J. Garnett also on that 1,000 point club with 1,303 points. That's exactly uh, right. Lighting it up back in the day when the three points were new. So uh, J.J. Garnett is a phenomenal player as well. Uh, so that's, that's your t- that's the first of five. That's the first of five of many. Again, those are in no particular order. Right. Uh, the next guy coming up was a teammate of mine. Love this guy. I already mentioned tonight. Wait, wait, uh, wait, 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 little... wait, 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 wait. Aren't we going to do the uh, the what? after the first five? Weren't we going to do the worth of mentions? Yeah, we can do some worth of mentions. <laughs> All right, guys. So we also come up with this list of guys that aren't quite honorable mentions. Aren't quite aren't quite top 25, but definitely worth mentioning uh, just because of either their status with the, with, the, with, the, with the Bayshore community or what they meant to the program overall, uh, or just their uniqueness. Two guys on here, I mean, I just love them to death. Neither one of them was on the top 25, uh, one because of injury, the other one because he just uh, 
played in an era where there's too many other players. But anyway, Steve, do you want to go ahead with the 70s and early 80s worth of mentions? Yeah, let me do some of those because I, I got to meet uh, uh, Jim Brown. Jim Brown is a great man, uh, accomplished professional. We've mentioned on the show before because he's been interviewed, of course, on his own podcast, worked for DEA, uh, great friends with his teammates such as Reggie Sanford, and, and part of a, a Bayshore royalty family, the Brown family, because we were doing girls basketball, we'd start talking about Mary Brown, who was one of the greats of all time on the girls basketball side. So the reason we can't put the 70s on and the guys that graduate 80, 81, th there was never a winning record. And so as much as we, we, we love them, I mean, me getting to know Jim Brown, I mean, I feel like I would, if he asked me to go do something right now, I'd drive to his house and help him with it. I mean, that's how I have feel like him, feel about him as a man. So I, I love him to death, him and his brother, Jim and Joe Brown. But, but to make the top 25 greatest of all time, you have to have data, statistics, and your performance needed to help your team win. And so it's hard to put 70s and early and pre-Valdez guys on there other than, than the one we have, Reggie Sanford. A couple more, Kevin Clifford. Kevin Clifford bri uh, bridged over from the Jim Brown era and Reggie Sanford era into the Coach Valdez era. And OG Harville has said that Clifford even started for Coach Valdez for several games at the beginning of the year, one of their better shooters uh, so Kevin Clifford gets a worth a mention. He's worth mentioning. Marty Adams played that whole year, his senior year that was Valdez's first year, 6'5 center. He's worth mentioning as well. Another, another man, uh, rest in peace, Jeff Holt. I did not know him. We did not get to see any tape or video. He's in a lot of box scores and his teammates, Jim Brown, Joe Brown, Reggie, all loved Jeff Holt and spoke very highly of him. So I saw those 70s and early 80 guys along with Jim Martin, who also played in the 70s. Those guys deserve mentioning on the greatest of all time. We've got 275 to 300 Bayshore players. We're naming about one out of every 10 or 11 on the top 25 list. But there's another group like we're here that's worth mentioning, and that's some of those guys. So that's what I would say about the 70s and early 80s. Back to you, Chris, and who you've got as worth mentioning. Well, I'm going to hold off of my guys, Steve. I uh, appreciate that. But I'm going to go ahead and start with the uh, next five guys that are on the top of okay. five yep. list. Yep. This will be breaking up a little bit more later on. And I think I'm up next. Uh, as I stated, this was a teammate of mine. Uh, I already stated a <laughs> It was such a pleasure to see him. Uh, he was, you know, he was a three-year varsity letterman, uh, really a role player in 86 and 87. Came into his own in 88. Uh, it just lit it up with the three-point line. You got to remember, prior in '86, '87, we didn't have a three-point line. Uh, in '88, the three-point line comes in, and Kevin Noriega finds out Ooh. where the line is at and makes it hey, baby. Uh, he was honorable mention all county '88, all conference in '88, team MVP in '88. Uh, his BCS icon status is, is off the charts, and there's nobody better than Manuel Noriega, his dad. I uh, love that guy to death. He supported every single uh, thing that Bayshore ever put out, uh, band, music, basketball, any type of sports. Anytime there was a spaghetti dinner, you know, Mr. Noriega is right there to serve it and eat it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Vic, Vic, Victor's been doing a good job of losing weight. He's really thinned out in his in his uh, later years. So, uh, Vic, good job of losing the weight. But anybody, when we were in school, he was a big man. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's somebody to be feared for sure, you know. But uh, his, his senior year, he was a top 10, top 10 in the county in scoring. Uh, I think he probably ended up averaging over 20 points a game. And uh, the biggest reason that Kevin O'Regan is on this list is because we actually got to see uh, in action what it means to have to lose somebody uh, as important as Noriega on your team. We've got this dynamic that we measure, as we call it the war. And basically what it is, it tells, it basically determines how much that person means to their particular team or how much they could add to a different team if they were taken off their team and placed somewhere else. And it's never more evident in the Kevin Noriega saga because in fact, uh, going into districts, Kevin Noriega fractures his arm and is not able to play in districts. And Bayshore goes, goes from being the odds on favorite to a 20-point underdog overnight because they lose Kevin Noriega. 
And in fact, they end up not winning districts because they don't have Tor Kevin Noriega, despite the fact that they have several other very capable players on the team. Um, so again, I mean, just, just a wonderful guy, uh, a base shore icon there for many years, um, Kevin Noriega. Steve, what do you have to say about Kevin? Yeah, I mean, he was a he was a great friend of mine. He was a couple of years behind me, uh, a year behind you. Uh, played on that great team, as you said. Uh, he is, of course, the icon status is off the charts, as you said. I mean, the famous duffel bag into the pool at Florida Gator Camp is legendary. Um, what was the other one? I mean, the injury you pointed out, the war wins against replacement. What would happen if you were replaced in the lineup? So a lot of these guys are on this list, not just for stats. So they got stats and other guys got stats, but then you compare it. If you take this guy out of the lineup, what happens? Or if you plug him in somewhere else, what happens? And Kevin Noriega, as you said, is the classic war example, wins against replacement. Because when you replace Noriega, it got bad. Uh, even though we had an all-state guy in Faido on the team. So uh, that you're exactly right. He definitely belongs on this list. He's now the sixth player we've listed uh, in the top 25 all-time team. And, that's and I just want to mention one more thing about Kevin. Before we move on, let's not forget also that in 1987, Kevin Noriega came off the bench against Miami Berkshire in the semifinals and heaved a 30-footer at the half that went in that gave us the lead over Miami Berkshire that I believe we never gave up again. Uh, so right. completely, um, perhaps maybe the second greatest shot in the history. Right. Very good point. Uh, it, yeah, Kevin Ray, game day player, baby. We love you. Um, so anyway, go on. He was, he was one of the greats. Yeah, he was one of the greats. I think the so the number seven again. There, this is in random order, but the seventh name we've listed. I've got, excuse me, and that's JoJo Santiago, class of 1985. So we're going back again to the early 80s and the original gangsters. You could literally name five, six, seven guys off this team. They won over 20 games three straight years in a row. They won a district title. They were the first Final Four team in school history. But we call them the original gangsters because they were sort of like gangsters. I mean, you were coming to a street fight uh, when you played Bayshore, and that sort of set our reputation for years to follow. JoJo had uh, great accolades that we can mention here. Honorable mention all county both 1984 and 1985. Third team all state. He was an all state guy in 1984. He was all Bay Conference, 83, 84, and 85. 13 points per game, career scoring average. Again, important to remember, if your team is averaging 52 points a game and you have 13, you're almost 20 to 25% of the offense. It's just a different era. And he was a three-year starter on varsity, averaging double figures every year that he started. JoJo was one of the originals one of the greats, you could, again, the war thing, if you take them out of that team, that team probably still wins. But if you plug them into a team that was struggling, they would automatically win. That's how good he was as the point guard, along with the other point guard we'll mention later. So that's who I have as our seventh person on the list, Jojo Santiago. Uh, what do you think, Chris? Uh, again, Jojo's one of those guys that we all watched uh, before we got to Bayshore and made us want to go to Bayshore, you know? That's right. Uh, watch Watching play against, uh, you know, Plant City and um, stepping up to the competition, just a phenomenal guy. Uh, watching them in those uh, those district games, those conference championships, uh, just these guys, like Steve said, man, I mean, these guys are just warriors. That's all there is to it. In fact, Jojo Santiago's parents used to dress up as Bay Shore Faith Warriors <laughs> for the games. So it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> That's right. Very good. Yeah. Anyway. So the next guy on the list, uh, I have the privilege to, to talk about. I was going to try to say something funny, you know, but honestly, I don't want to do that because I don't want to take away from the fact that this guy is a phenomenal athlete, phenomenal player. Um, I knew him even before his base short time. Uh, you know, he played on the team that went 19 and 10 his senior year. Uh, we talked about the wins against, you know, the WAR, the WAR uh, acronym. Uh, if you take a wins against replacement. If you take this guy and replace him with somebody else, what happens to that team? I can guarantee you that this guy's senior year, if you took him off the court, that team ends up with a losing record for sure. No doubt about it. Uh, he averaged almost 18 points a game his senior year. Uh, this is again three, pre three point line. So, you know, not doing threes left and right like some of these guys nowadays. He was top 10 in the county in scoring. He was honorable mention of county. 
Arlington on state. He was an uh, all Bay conference and uh, he scored 25 or more points in the first five games of the season. Uh, so he wasn't somebody that had to like just warm, you know, it took time to warm up. He was ready to go from the get go. Uh, he had, you know, clutch status with closeout scoring and road wins versus the, the number five team, team in the state. And close out the free throws and scoring versus number seven at the time, right within the prep. Uh, he was heavily guarded because there really wasn't anybody else on the team. So for him to average 18 points a game almost is phenomenal uh, when you're facing a box at one night in and night out. Um, that's really all I have to say. Other than the fact that also this guy, people don't know this, but if, if, if but for the fact that his previous school had shoddy statistical records, he would be on the thousand point list and probably high up there, uh, perhaps number one or number two. Anyway, that's my partner tonight, my co host, my friend, uh, class of 86, Steve Rodriguez. Um, can't say enough about him. Uh, I'm not going to ask you, Steve, what you have to say about this guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and again, I mean, this is a, you know, this was, he's a unanimous decision for this. Um, anybody can tell you that he's one of the greatest competitors you'll ever meet. Um, I don't know how many times he and I got into fist fights on the basketball court or tried to, you know, uh, drown each other in the swimming pool, playing, swim, playing basketball pool. Uh, but anyway, just a, just a phenomenal player. Uh, not to mention the fact that everything he's done for the Beast for Facial Christian over the years uh, and helping us draw uh, great players and great talent to the school. And uh, yeah, I mean, without this guy, man. Uh, 1986 ends up as a losing season. So there you go. Uh, one of our top 25 this year is Steve Rodriguez. Yeah, Steve, I mean, I, I had to pay. The next I had to pay hundreds of dollars to get all you guys to vote for me. So that cost me a lot. <laughs> Whatever. So uh, uh, well, no. you know, I mean, again, I mean, the thing that uh, I think that the thing that goes unfounded or people don't find remarkable is that they don't know your stats prior to getting to Bayshore. You know, um, you played on a FCC state championship team at Providence. You know, I mean, you scored over, you know, over your career, you had definitely way over a thousand points, probably approaching the 1500 point mark. Uh, and again, if it wasn't for shoddy record keeping by, you know, previous schools, we could document that and have you on this list as well. So Steve, I mean, you, you definitely deserve to be on this list. There's no doubt about it. And uh, I, I'm proud to, to, to announce it for you. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, obviously great friends and, and uh, great teammates and uh, great time. So very thankful and uh, glad, to, glad to be on this list with such great players. Uh, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't, like Fred Tomasello once said, we don't hold a jock strap to those guys. So I'm, I'm just very thankful to be thought of it. So thanks for that. <laughs> uh, moving on to the next one. I mean, that's uh, our, our eighth uh, name on the list. Uh, number nine, uh, is, is a modern one. It's a 21st century guy. Is that our first, have we had a 21st century yet? Yes, we had Joseph Rollins. He's the first. No, Joseph Rollins, Joseph Rollins. Yeah, um, he's bar barely. <laughs> right, and, uh, and now this one, this is, a, this is a legendary, iconic name in Hillsborough County basketball history, and that's Fred Lewis. I don't know if he's the second or the third. His dad's name's Fred Lewis, played at Chamberlain, University of Tampa, and Fred Lewis. Uh, what can you say? Graduate 2010. Um, he's on the 1,000 point club, as you mentioned. It's very important to point out, we've listed every 1,000 point score except for one that we know of. And you brought up a good point when mentioning the previous person. John Edwards has over 1,000 points, but he's not listed on the school website. Uh, we, we've got the books for him, added it all up, and he has over 1,000 points. So hard to tell, but this guy is a 1,000 point scorer. A great career at, at uh Bayshore, as well as college at the University of Tampa. He averaged 20 points a game, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade each year. Uh, he was first team all county 2009 and 2010, all Bay Conference 2008, 2009, 2010, fourth team all state. That's interesting to me that they added a fourth team uh, you know, in these recent years. Um, top five in the county in scoring, top uh, in 2010, top 10 in the county scoring 2009. He's the only BCS player that we know of, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but he's the only one that I could find that averaged a double-double for three straight years. So you've got John Edwards at uh, 14 and 
and uh, 11 or whatever it was for his career. But I think his sophomore year, he only had eight assists a game. So Lewis did it, didn't just average it for a career. He averaged it each year of his career. I think that's pretty impressive. Uh, his, his team was district champions in 2008 during the Donald uh, Dwayne Pippen era. Uh, signed with University of Tampa. He has a high Bayshore icon status given his family name. Um, you know, I still struggle with how that team over a three-year period only won one district title. But there's no denying Fred Lewis belongs on this list as one of the top 25 of all time. He's a college signee and he dominated uh, the opposition when he played. So that's our next guy on the list, Fred Lewis and well-deserved. Yeah, and that's an mention. And I don't know if you mentioned Knotsky, but also just, uh, uh, just from a, a county standpoint, I mean, comes from a, a family of just uh, great hoop players and coaches. Uh, so his, his, his Hillsborough County uh, status is, is elite. Uh, anyway, uh, so next on the list is a graduate of the class of 96. He was all Bay Conference two years in a row from 1995 to 96. Uh, he was all, he was, uh, I don't mention all county 95 and 96. Uh, he was a varsity player for Bayshore for four years uh, during an era uh, that was pretty heavy laden with talent. So it's actually quite an accomplishment during the time period that he played. Um, he didn't lead the team in any specific category, He, but uh, again, he comes from a, a family uh, that uh, has high Hillsborough County uh, and Bayshore ties, uh, but that's not the reason he's on this list. Uh, he made, he's on this list because he was one of the key components of the 1994 team that went to the Final Four, and uh, he played multiple Final Four teams, and he was a thousand point scorer, and that's John Fielder. Uh, Steve, anything to add about John Fielder? No, you covered it. I'm, I mean, I'm sure he was all Bay Conference. I, I, my list is here. I could probably refer to it. What makes Fielder compelling is not only is his brother Reggie Sanford one of the original Bayshore stars, and you mentioned his family name, but what makes Fielder compelling is that he seems to be present at almost all of the great moments of the early to mid '90s. I mean, he's a right. star, he's a starter and a and a double digit rebounder or something to that effect on the 1993-94 Jonathan Johnson Final Four team. He then is present and a heavy contributor to the 94-95 Final Four team that had the miracle at Ramey. He's, he's on the floor at, during the miracle at Ramey. So he's a double-double guy. He was in the right place at the right time. Highly skilled player. I think if you take Fielder out and put him on another team, they get better. Um, Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so his yeah. war his war metric is high, his icon metric is high, and then just with traditional basketball statistics, he's there in the top three, four, or five of his team in every category. So well deserving uh, to be on the top twenty five all time list. Absolutely, quite a banger down in the quite a banger down in the post for sure. That's exactly right. All right. Yeah. So real quick, let's really go over the first ten that are on the list. We've got. Uh, yeah. Reggie Sanford, John Harville, uh, Drew Polito, Joseph Rollins, JJ Garnett, as well as Kevin Noriega, Jojo, Jojo Santiago, some guy by the name of Rodriguez, Fred Lewis, and John Fielder. Now we did the worth a mention group. There are a couple of worth a mentions still left that I'd like to name, and then you'll take over with more worth a mentions or honorable mentions. Yeah, let's do some worth a mentions. Okay, some more worth a mentions. What I've got, and we didn't put them on our list. I think it's sort of like crazy. I think we just sort of knew we would name him. And that's Chris Patterson. There, Chris Patterson uh, is sort of like a for, like the Forgotten Kings, the Polito team. Chris Patterson sort of forgotten cog. Chris Patterson for, for a long period of time was Mr. Bayshore. I mean, you have the original gangsters. You have the 87 greatest team of all time that you played on. <laughs> but Patterson was, the, his, his grandparents were in the heavy in the church. They were on the church board the school board they preached on Sundays uh Patterson's in elementary school at Bayshore middle school at Bayshore plays on a JJV team plays on a junior I team gets called up to varsity on that 84 final four team doesn't see the court but he gets called up uh and then averages I think double digits uh my senior year 86 he was one of the big three me Fred and Chris and then uh of course was a starter and a knockdown jump shooter 
pre three point line on the greatest team of all time. Patterson's worth a mention. Uh, he's always, yeah, he's always a couple of data points below moving to the top 25. Uh, his war number, you take him out, plug him in. I'm not sure what that does, but bottom line, he deserves a worth a mention because he was, he was Mr. Bayshore for the longest period of time. Absolutely. No doubt about it. And that's really the uh, only, yeah, that's the only new one I got. I, I would mention Dalvin Devine as well as worth a mention. Poor Dalvin. Oh, yeah. Dalvin was an athlete. I mean, he used to be ripped. He was, he lifted weights. He was a great ball player, uh, but he was sort of the two guard on a team that was dominated by Peterson. He had Joe place at the one. Uh, he made some historic memorable plays that we have documented on the top 10 games of all time. His famous steal and layup at the buzzer against Broward Christian to upset them down in their gym. But that team had five guys that averaged 10 points and seven assists or rebounds. And we couldn't pick them all because uh, the data just wasn't enough. Dalvin, though, worth, is worth a mention. So that, those are my two remaining worth of mentions. All right. Uh, so I'm going to mention one of my worth of mentions now. Hold, one more, hold the other one for a little bit longer because it's one that we, you and I both we both <laughs> agree on. Um, but my worth of mention right now, I'm going to bring us to present day. Uh, actually, actually up, to, up to this last season. And I swear to goodness, he's got to be the greatest dunker in Bayshore history. Now we're talking. Throw down. <laughs> he is a phenomenal spectacle, uh, a backboard shattering phenomenon. Uh, and George Washington played this year and uh, may not be one of the top 25, but definitely worth a mention. That's Christian Rolock. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Without question. I mean, uh, you best dunker ever in Bayshore history. And we've had some Got good. Ones. We've had some good. <laughs> uh, so he was one of the greats. I forgot to mention a few more because I don't know how much more we're going to do. I'm worth a mention. Carson Day was a double digit scorer on a district champion in the 2000s. He was beloved by his teammates and fellow classmates. He's one of those Mr. Bayshore guys. So he certainly should be worth a mention. I, I don't want to steal any of yours. I mean, so cut me off. BJ Day, Coach Day's son. Yeah. He really deserves more discussion, and I hopefully we get an episode to talk about those 2,000 teams. B B what keeps BJ off for me is that they had a losing record one season. He only averaged seven points another season. So what you did in college or what you may have become is not what this list is about. This list is about what you did at Bayshore, and there just wasn't enough to move him up. It's certainly worth a mention. I mean, I wouldn't want to play him in one-on-one. -on -one. He would kick my tail, obviously. He'd kick a lot of people. Right. He, he was a great ball player. And he was brought up as a coach's son. So uh, deserves mentioning, but the data wasn't there for much more. Did you have any others that you wanted to add? Uh, the only two were the mentions, the only other two were the mentions I have. But I want to mention Wayne Stewart, uh, played during the Dean Cady era, was a three year varsity player, uh, really didn't come as long until his senior year. He left the team in scoring his senior year. Um, they went 25 and five his senior year. Unfortunately, uh, Coach Cady. Coach K, he loved him to death, great friend. Uh, he just had a bug about him that he just couldn't walk that district title. It was kind of funny because he would lose the district title, but then they'd go the next round of playoffs, he'd win the regional game. Uh, so right, it was, right. It was one of those things that you know, he couldn't pull that district title. Anyway, Wayne Seward, uh, again, 25 and 5 in senior year, led the team in scoring. Uh, his WAR is off the charts. If you take him off that team, uh, they go 15 and 10, not 25 and 10. Wow. Uh, I want to mention him. And then the last one that I want to mention, my last worth I mentioned mention is probably Steve and I's favorite player of all time, despite the fact he only played 22 games in the Bayshore uniform, just 14 games this year because of the broken arm, and uh, just phenomenal, uh, gregarious to this day. Uh, one of those guys that is a killer instinct. Night in and night out. I didn't know if he was there to fight, if he was there to play basketball. And that's Todd Brandenburg. Mr. Oh my Hollywood God. Himself. We're not naming Brandenburg to the top 25 greatest of all time? <laughs> How could uh, he be left off? I don't know. That would be no, close I, to nepotism. Because I, 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 <laughs> I love him like a brother. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I mean, Steve, you want to, you want to expand on Todd Brandenburg? Is there, is there anything else? Look, Anything else we haven't really said about Brandenburg at this point in time? Brandenburg is the greatest human being to ever walk the face of the earth. He is the most dominant. <laughs> I mean, 
He destroyed anything in his path on the way to victory. The man is a Renaissance man. He's a Hollywood actor. He's traveled in China. He plays basketball. He's a Renaissance man. He is literally the greatest human life form to ever walk the face of the earth. I can't believe we haven't put him on the greatest list. He is a Bayshore. If we were having the top Bayshore personalities of all time or the Hall of Fame of greatest characters. Number one, number one, for sure. <laughs> and, and in terms of hardcore, he is an OG. You put him and Polito back in the 1980s, those teams win every fight. They're in jail for killing people, and we win more championships. That's what would happen. So, yeah, I love Brandenburg. That's a great worth of mention. I keep I, there's a few there's a few more before we move on. I mean, we don't want to not mention where, where did I have it? Yeah. Rodney Rodney Lewis from the '93 team. I mean, he deserves a mention right. for Showtime. Him yeah. and Eric Wright. That's yeah. Um, yeah. And then Eric you got Wright. Yeah. From the 2000s. Uh, great player for for Coach Day. Right. Um, you got a, you got David yeah. you got David Schram. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Schram. Yes, yeah, Schram. Schram, like you and and my my co-host. When we do the baseball episode, people need to understand you're you're looking at one of Tampa's greatest baseball players of all time. Certainly, one of Bayshore's greatest base, baseball players of all time. And the data supports it when we do the baseball show. Schram Schram was no slouch. He came right after your era. Um, and Shram was a major baseball player, but he was a knockdown jump. His jump shot was knocked down automatic for that 89-90 Peterson JJ team. That for sure is there may be more. I mean, I'm, I apologize if we're missing guys, but that for sure is my final worth of mention for tonight. Maybe we'll see it on Facebook in the coming days. Uh, but right now we've got 10 on the list of top 25. We've mentioned another 10 or 12 worth of mentions. And now we're moving on to the next batch of five. And I don't know who's up. Do you know who's up? Uh, I know who's up. Uh, one of my dearest friends. I've uh, known this guy since I was about 12 years old. Uh, one of the greatest basketball and baseball players I've ever known. Uh, completely undersized. If you looked at this guy, you'd say, there's no way that guy can play basketball. you got to be kidding me. Stood about 5'7 or so, but I think that's stretching it. Uh, Mr. Bayshore himself, Mr. Basketball. He was second all time, second team all county in 87. He was honorable mention all, all state in 87. He was all Bay Conference. He led the county in assists in 1987. He uh, averaged a double double in, in points per game and assists in 87. Uh, his record while at Bayshore was a phenomenal 53 and 14. Of course, he's on the team that went 34 and 3 and won district and conference championship. He's a three-sport athlete. I mentioned baseball and basketball. Also, a pretty well-renowned soccer player. Largely considered the best point guard of the city in 1987. Uh, I could go on and on. Great guy. Uh, known him forever. And uh, I just have the greatest accolades for, for this guy and the greatest appreciation to have played with him. Uh, it's Freddie Tomasello, class of 1987. Uh, Steve, I know you have a lot to say about this guy as well. Well, the three of us go back together. I mean, we go back to, I mean, people need to go back and watch the uh, Brandon Boys podcast episode with the three of us. I mean, it goes back to uh, growing up in uh, Brandon uh, prior to Bayshore. We've been together for years, uh, yeah. whether it was Youth League or then Providence, uh, you name it. And you've already said everything about Fred, but you can never say enough about Freddie Tomasello. He's one of the nicest people you'll ever meet, yet he's also one of the toughest competitors you'll ever face. He and I, and you as well, but he and I specifically got into some round robin throwing hands uh, fisticuffs all the time. It's a running joke at Bayshore Christian with Coach Sam and Herman and Tom Dibble as who was going to break us up. Every one-on-one -on -one game, whoever fell behind started a fight uh, and, and that's, that's who we were. I mean, it was, you did not lose at Bayshore. You refused to lose. You already mentioned his baseball dominance. He was a soccer star as well. But some of the few winning seasons we had in soccer were for when Freddie and you guys were playing Donnie Amlin, I think played as well. Fred Tomasello, you said it all was the best point guard in Hillsborough County in 1987 on the best team in school history. And one of the greatest teams in the city of Tampa's history and, and a great friend. Uh, so how does it get any better than that? We spent more time in each other's homes than we did in our own. So, uh, you know, I love Fred 
and I'm glad that uh, you got to name him on this list. I'm glad to be here when it happened. Yeah, can't say can't say much more about Fred. Uh, you know, there, you'd be hard pressed to find any of it. So, in case you're wondering whether or not he deserves to be on this list, uh, find me another person on this list or anywhere in Bayshore history that led the county in the same year in assists and free throw percentage. Think right. about that. So, That's exactly right. Yeah, he definitely deserves to be on this team. There's no doubt about it. Uh, lots Fred, of great. I think you're, uh, Fred. <laughs> lots of great. Steve, you're up with the next guy. Yeah, lots of What's great. That? Lots of great Freddie stories, not just the fighting. I, I remember when Coach Valdez called him Sopito Pollo, which is chicken soup, <laughs> because Fred had chicken legs. You don't want to play with Fred, though. Th those legs were fast. But uh, Fred was the great. <laughs> Fred is one of the great people in the city of Tampa, and everybody knows him. I mean, everybody knows him right. in the city. He's one of the greats. So who do I have next? So that's our 11th on the list. Oh, I got a good one right here, man. I got a real yeah, good you one. Yeah, uh, it's sort of understated. People forget how good he was. From the class of 1988, number 12 on our list, Rob Fiedo. Fiedo was a transfer from Tampa Catholic. He was 6'7", 6'8", but not just tall. He was big, big, uh, well cut in the upper body. Uh, you can see his some of his tomahawk dunks on our YouTube page. 88 oh, team, yeah. yeah, 88 team goes 23 and six. And Rob Fiedo that year was was it was an honorable mention. A lot of us, a lot of us guys made honorable mention. He was second team. Oh, one more thing about Fred. Fred was one of the five or six guys of the unanimous ballots or whatever. So that was important for you. But back to Rob. Rob was second team all county 1988. He was all Bay Conference 1988. Honorable mention all state. People forget that Bayshore team did not win district, yet Fiedo made the all state team. That's how good he was. Top five in the county in rebounding. Top five, top 15 in the county in points per game. Average about four to five blocks per game, which had they kept that statistics would, would have led the county. He, and his, one of his most pivotal moments was he outdueled 6'10 Travis Shensis, the younger brother of NBA bound and Florida Gator Dwayne Shensis. Uh, I think he scored, uh, what do I got here? 33 points in a 72-71 Bayshore victory over class 3A or 4A Bloomingdale at the time. It's a game you've talked about being there with Kevin Daniels. Rob Fiedo was great in the one district playoff win. And then of course, without Noriega in game two, it, it wasn't enough, couldn't get him the ball. He was double teamed all the time. But Rob Fiedo goes down as one of the greatest. And he's a, he has a high icon score as well. His family does that, his, his uh, wife or sister, I forget, Fiedo's Bakery. Um, so famous food in Tampa. He's one of the great and one of the legendary Bayshore and Tampa names. So that's who I've got next on the list, Rob Fiedo. And he's on the list just for the fact that his uh, restaurant has the best Cuban sandwich you ever put in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> right. Very good. Go Very good. Tampa cuisine. No. But uh, let's just see what though. Yeah, I mean, Rob Fiedo, great, great, great player, a phenomenal athlete. Uh, you know, it just shows it right there, you know, Without without Noriega in, in the in the in the lineup, you know those teams were able to double down on Fiedo and take away from what he did best, which was control the blocks. Um, you know, just unfortunate series of events there. But yeah, Rob Fiedo actually was an absolutely phenomenal player. Absolutely. Uh, next next up on our list is from the class of 1996. He was an All Bay Conference player. He was honorable mention All County. Uh, his family is loved and revered by Bayshore Christian. Uh, this guy here, if you take him out of the game, uh, his uh, replacement metric, he, they probably lose three or, more, four, three or four more additional games. He was top 10 in the county in assists, had multiple 30-point games as a senior. So he was just one of the most versatile players probably perhaps ever played for Bayshore. He could score. He could dish it. Uh, he could play solid defense. Um, just a really tough nut. And that's, uh, he averaged a double-double in, in two of his years, 95 and 96. And that's John Blocker. Yeah. Uh, Steve, do you want to expound on John Blocker? Yeah, very good pick. John Blocker's icon status, Bayshore icon status with the Blocker name. His older brother, Mike, played on the greatest team of all time with you and played three years uh, on varsity. Uh, so the Blocker name had been there. But, but remember, John Blocker is most remembered for his years in elementary school, first, second, and third grade, 
where he would go out on the court and he would put on a ball handling exhibition. I mean, he would put on a clinic on handle on how to handle the basketball. And several years, the other school might have some kid who would come on the court to play him. And he would literally humiliate this eight-year-old in basketball, left-handed layups, right-handed layups, dribble between the legs, hesitation dribble. I mean, it was a show. I mean, you literally could pay to get in the game. And the most entertainment you would have was watching John Blocker beat the other school's elementary school kid at halftime. So the icon status is off the charts. I think the war number would be pretty high because he really ran the offense. So he played a little bit with Polito uh, one year and he, he played without Polito. He played with Bo Heinley and Scott Crone another. Uh, Polito was a, was chaos. He would steal the ball. He'd punch people in the mouth. He'd make threes. He was a playmaker. Uh, Crone and Heinley were shooters. Blocker set the table. So you could take him out and maybe those teams don't win as many games. I'm, I'm not sure about that because they are really good teams, but he certainly is deserving. He's now the 13th name we've listed. He belongs on the top 25 greatest of all time. And again, we said at the beginning, we need to pray for his brother who's gone into the hospital with COVID. It's a terrible disease. We're really worried about him. Make sure you keep them all in your prayers. I know that John is either with him or thinking about him. He belongs on this list and glad you mentioned him. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so next on our list is uh, one that I've got. He's in a thousand point uh, club as an all time score. Uh, he was reliable to get double digits every single night he stepped on the court. He was the prime component and best player of the Dean Cage era by far. Uh, this guy had a high war ratio. If you take him out of the game, uh, <laughs> Bay Shore probably during that, during that era loses half of those games. Uh, they go from winning records to losing records in an instant. Uh, mm -hmm. He could shoot, uh, he could dish. He could play defense. He could dribble. He could drive. Uh, he could do pretty much anything you needed him to do on the court. Uh, had a heart that just didn't stop. And uh, that's uh, T.J. Miller from the class of 2003. T.J. Miller, very good. And I'm glad you got to say his name because you were around for a lot of those years in the early late 90s, early 2000s. So that's one of your guys. The Kagi era is yeah. worth examination uh, because they had a couple of 25 and five teams. Uh, with some nondescript, you know, pedestrian lineups. And here's this kid, TJ Miller, and he'd been at Bayshore for a while. He's a Bayshore guy, and he could fill it up. I didn't get to see a lot of his games. I did coach against them and was fortunate to coach teams that beat those Bayshore teams. So I had to game plan and scout them. And he was a guy that we were worried about each time that we played him. So an excellent addition and worthy 1,000-point score, as you said. He belongs on this list, top 25 greatest of all time. Another from the 21st century, and that's T.J. Miller. So good call. I'm up next. Right, Steve, guy. Yeah, this is an important one. What we've just gone through over the last decade, and you and I have talked about it, how parents, because we're both parents, make decisions on private schools. The number of private schools in Tampa has almost tripled. The number of Christian schools are up. Uh, it is hard to have organically grown basketball programs, and Bayshore has been through the ringer. We've talked about some of those stories in previous podcasts. What we've enjoyed over the last 10 years in the Broderick Day era, 10 plus years, is five district titles, multiple 20-win teams, three district titles in a row, and a final four. That is dynastic. That's a dynasty. We are blessed to have 40 years of winning and a good chunk of it comes out of the Broderick Day era. And one of those players to play on three district titles in a row, God rest his soul, he lost his father this year. We certainly prayed for him when that happened and thinking of him as well, Dion Brown. Dion Brown was the big time contributor to one of the great Broderick Day teams. He was all Bay Conference 2019-2021, second team all county 3A, 2A, 1A, 2019. First team all county, 3A, 2A, 1A, 2020. Honorable mention all county, 3A, 2A, 1A in 2021. Honorable mention all state, 2020. Has a high BCS icon status, high Hillsborough County basketball icon status. Top 15 in scoring, 2020 in the county. Top 10 in the scoring in Hillsborough County, 2021. His team won three straight district titles and went to a final four. That's a lot of hardware for one guy, Dion Brown, our 15th name on this list, 
and is well deserved to be on the top 25 greatest Bayshore players of all time. What do you think, Chris? Uh, yeah, he's a phenomenal player. I got to meet him once. Uh, one of the basketball games this past year that I was fortunate to go to. A uh, really humble kid. Uh, gave everything they had every night on the court. Phenomenal shooter. Um, never seen anything quite like that recently. He could just fill it up from the three-point line. Um, absolutely deserving of this. I mean, the the stats speak for themselves in terms of personal stats and team stats. And uh, again, again, you know, we talk about the wins against replacement differential. You take this guy off the court. Does that team win three district championships? I don't know. I don't think so. But anyway, yeah, just put on the player. And, and again, so appreciative of what Coach Day has done the, the past few years. And again, we keep uh, keep Deion Brown's uh, family in our prayers as, we, as he's lost his father this year. Yeah. Very good. So, Chris, we're through 15 names. We're going to do the final seven together. So there's like three in the middle we still have left to do. So I think we need to go to the uh, honorable mention list, right? Yeah, let's do it. So the honorable mention list is, uh, is you, you've made the top, uh, the Bayshore all-time team. Your honorable mention on the Bayshore all-time team. So it is, a, it, it is an honorable recognition, we think, <laughs> from our list making uh, so let me find the list here. I know we had like 10 names. I'll name a couple and I'll turn it over to you. You name a couple. Uh, the first one I got comes from the 1970s. So we had Reggie Sanford, who is a top 25 greatest player who played in the 70s, graduated in 81. This guy is one of the first players at Bayshore. And people, people will talk about uh, Bayshore was integrated before any private school in the city. It was integrated from day one. Uh, it had a female principal, I think, in the first couple, se second or third year, African-American kids. That was rare in the 1970s. Otto Johnson, on, on teams that never won, the 70s did not win, have winning seasons. But Otto Johnson from ninth through 12th grade in the 70s was a 20-point-a-game guy. I mean, th that's really good in a pre-three-point era on a team that's barely scoring 40 or 50 points a game. So from my perspective, and, and we of course agreed on this top 10 list and, you, and I appreciate you agreeing on this one because I really wanted Otto Johnson to get honorable mention and he's my first name that I would list. Uh, do you have any thoughts on Otto? You want me to give my second one? Yeah, you know, I don't know much about Otto Johnson to be honest with you. Uh, just what I've read in the newspaper and seen in the clippings. Um, but, you know, like you mentioned, those teams weren't very good back then. And if you're averaging 20 a game on a team that plays 140, that's 50%. Um, that's pretty darn good in my book. Right. So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The second one I got, and then I'll, I'll want to hear your your uh, list or the beginnings of your list, is uh, Major Bloom. How does Major Bloom not make the top 25? Going back to that Peterson team, you had Peterson, Division I, 20-plus 20 point, 20 points a game, 25, whatever it was. You had five guys averaging 10 to 12 points. Major Bloom is one of those guys, and I think – the second or third leading scorer on the team. And he also averaged seven rebounds a game. Major Bloom has one of the great moments in Bayshore history. That 34-2 and two Peterson team almost did not get out of district, which happens often, as your, your team knew as well. They were yeah. playing Lake Santa Fe Catholic, who they'd beaten by 40 twice. Santa Fe spreads the floor as a great game plan. And the score is tied because we missed a couple of free throws. They come down, score, and tie it. Major Bloom on the next offensive possession makes the jump shot, which is the winning basket to win the district title game. I, I'm surprised we didn't think of it for the top 10 games of all time. There's so many, so maybe that's why. But uh, that team doesn't go to the Final Four. They, don't, they may not win advance if they lose that game. District championship uh, streak continues, thanks to Major Bloom. He's a, a double-digit scorer on a great team. We'll talk about why he didn't beat one of his teammates out on this list when we get to that player. But Major Bloom is honorable mention, one of the greatest in Bayshore history. Any thoughts on that, or do you want to go to your list next? Let's go ahead and hit my list real quick here. Um, yeah, obviously Major Bloom, great player on that team. Uh, double, you know, double points per game, probably close to double rebounds a game. Uh, but I want to mention a guy again, closer to the, uh, the new age, uh, this guy, but for a couple of injuries, may have actually made our top 25, uh, very highly rated by his coach. And uh, we took a hard look at this guy. I've got to tell you, it was a tough call. 
Um, but definitely worth a definitely worth a mention. Definitely a, an honorable mention. Uh, it just missed out on the top 25, but it has the slimmest of margin. And that's a four year varsity player, Jeremiah Wicks. Um, lots of great data. Again, this parts of two seasons with severe injuries. And, uh, you know, if he doesn't get injured in the final four run of 2020, they may win the whole thing. Heck, you know, who knows? That's a what if there. Um, and again, he probably would have been on the list um, had he not get injured. The other one that I want to mention real quick is we've already mentioned his name several times tonight. And that's a friend of mine, three year starter on varsity, uh, part of, you know, some of the biggest teams in Bayshore history. So those are 34 and three. Uh, state finals team, uh, one of the key components of the 1997 98 team, uh, or 1987 team, uh, with Fido and, and Kevin Noriega. Uh, and again, huge BCS uh, icon status. Uh, and one of those guys that was never the best in the team, but certainly deserved of, of a mention here, and that's uh, Mike Blocker. Yeah, I mean, Blocker, you know, his brother made the team because his brother was a was great, dominant point guard. Mike was great too, but like you said, I mean, he just wasn't, there was no separation on the statistics on those teams and they were great teams and his war number was really low. I mean, if you pull them out, do those teams keep winning? The answer is probably yes, but we love Mike. Mike's our, our great friend. He's probably going to be ticked at us now that we didn't put him in the top 25, but, uh, and certainly praying <laughs> for, pr certainly praying for his health, health, but uh, certainly deserves honorable mention because he was around for some of the great moments and, and was a starter on, on a good good to great team, and then the starting point guard on the greatest team of all time. So I agree with that. Really good call on Jeremiah Wicks. People don't realize Wicks was on the list, then off the list. On the list, <laughs> then off. We, we've been at this for over a year, comparing data, clippings, video. Some of the things that for me, I wouldn't have worried so much about the injury. I agree with you, but it wouldn't have been the biggest thing for me. The biggest thing for me was the only video I could find on Broderick's YouTube page, and I found it online in a couple other places. The opposition that they were producing statistics against many times was not really that good. Uh, so it was hard for me to measure greatest player, greatest player, top 25 greatest from the video that I had to review. Uh, so Jeremiah was right there, up and down, certainly deserves honorable mention. So I'm going to mention a couple more. So we've mentioned four honorable mention. I got uh, Kenny Cox. Kenny Cox is literally an, an all-state player. He was all-state in the 1984 Final Four run. We've mentioned Santiago. We've mentioned Harville of the original gangsters. There's another one coming up here really quick. Who, who do you pull out? I mean, Cox had a memorable run in the late season and postseason of 1984, but oh, is he one of the top 25 greatest of all time? Are you picking him over a Harville or a Santiago when you're at the park to play in a, in a pickup game. I mean, Cox was great for a period of time, and then he had a decline in his statistics his senior year. So the up and down nature or the limited nature of his dominance uh, kept him off the list, even though he was an all-state guy. So that was one. And then, of course, uh, David Santiago. David Santiago played on a district championship team averaged 14 or 15 points for his career class of 2018. Santiago had the frame. You look at his body and you're saying that is a high level high school basketball player. But again, I was stuck with the comp the opposition. There was a video I watched, you and I talked about it, of Bayshore versus Southland Christian. And when we first found it, this was like a year ago, I'm like, man, that's, this is a great JV game. And come to find out it was a regional playoff varsity game. So the, the quality of play uh, and players was hard for me to move him higher. I know it's disappointing for some, uh, but certainly worth mentioning as honorable mention on the greatest of all time, those two. What do you got next? Um, so from the class of 1998, uh, again, part of an iconic Bayshore family, phenomenal point guard, uh, probably doesn't get enough credit for what he did. Uh, and that's Chris Fitz, Fitzpatrick. Um, you know, unfortunately, he fell into a, a time period in Bayshore history that wasn't uh, the greatest uh, in terms of what their competition and how they compete with other teams. But uh, he was able to uh, drive those teams. I think his uh, win differential is really high. I think if you take him out of a lot of those games he played in in the 97-98 season, um, they lose a lot of those games. 
uh, just because he not only he wasn't a, the greatest scorer. I mean, he scored enough points. I think he got double digits, double digits average on the season. But uh, just the way he could set up other people on the floor, you know, just one of the best dish guys I've ever seen. Uh, he could, you know, he could definitely hand out the dime. Uh, and that's Chris Fitzpatrick, class of 1998. Yeah, very good. And I think I think we said 98. He might be 99. But you all all the points you hit are right. Uh, Fitzpatrick was a great distributor, great shooter, great defender. He, unfortunately, he fell in the Drury year, which was, you know, subpar. It was just right above 500. And then he had a Dibble Renaissance year, uh, which he played with a guy by the name of Ty Tancredi, who transferred to Tampa Catholic. Uh, so Fitzpatrick had a great Bayshore career. He's more than worth a mention. He is honorable mention. He was a great Bayshore basketball player from – middle school, JJV all the way up, but he just fell in the wrong place at the wrong time. Put him with you guys, put him with the Rollins team a couple of years later, and he's a big time jump shooter on, a, on great teams. So I agree yeah. with that one as well. Don't you have a, I, 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 I've been saving, there's two more. One of them is your guy, so I wanted to save it. <laughs> was my guy? Yeah, uh, uh, Brooks, 04, you were coaching then, weren't you? Yeah, absolutely. So one of our other honorable mentions, and it was hard to keep this guy off the list. He was a thousand point scorer for his career. You have to uh, put an asterisk, asterisk against that though, because he did play varsity basketball for five years, uh, and, and so um, even though he wasn't a starter, I mean, you know, eighth and ninth grade year, he was playing varsity at that time period. Um, again, never really the best player on his team at any on any one year that he played. Um, definitely worth uh, getting you ten to twelve to points a game. Uh, really a tough player. One of the smartest players I've ever seen, actually. Uh, great peripheral vision. Um, kind of could, could read everything on the court. And uh, just all around athlete, and that's Philip Brooks. Yeah, Philip Brooks. I mean, 1,000 points score. 1,000 points in the 2000s for me, I'm not speaking for you, is it's got to be more than that. You, know, you play two or three years, you get a three-point line. Not that he was a three-point shooter. But the scoring was inflated. As you go into the 21st century, you're talking about 70 to 80 points. You and I played, you're walking it up, and the score is 40 to 38. So, but that doesn't take away from the fact that he got those thousand points. He played on some winning teams that were really good thanks to his effort. He gave all he had for his school. His mom was a principal. Uh, great family, great young man. I got him honorable mention as well. I've got two more names left. I don't know what, if you want to go ahead and announce them or you want me to announce them and you can still talk about them. No, go ahead. Go ahead. One is Matthew Eckerman. I'll just be quick. 2015. He deserves honorable mention because the guy scored 14 plus and then 15 plus and was a leading scorer on back-to-back -back teams. And he played on a district championship team as the primary leading scorer. So the 21st century gets another guy on the list. If you're the leading scorer on a team that wins 20 games and a district title, and then you followed up your senior year with a winning record and you increase your scoring output that's a guy that's honorable mention in my view. And then the last honorable mention we have, we have 10 honorable mention guys, the miracle at Ramey. Do you want to name? <laughs> I mean, one, one of the greats, one of the greats, Bo Heinley, Bo Heinley. I, I can talk about it. Yeah. Bo, Bo, you know, miracle at Ramey. It wasn't just that. I mean, you're talking about all conference, honorable mention, all County, one of the great jump shooters in school history, Played on back-to-back -back Final Four teams. Starter on that second Final Four team. A lot of accolades, um, but was always one of many. He had Jonathan Johnson, Tree Fielder. The next year, you had Jed. You had John Blocker. You had John Fielder again. So uh, Bo Einley deserves mention on this greatest of all time list. But the data, whether it was scoring or didn't lead the team in scoring maybe or whatever it was, it wasn't enough to push him over. What do you think? No, I, I agree. Absolutely. You know, Bo, Bo Imley was a great role player. Uh, and some of those uh, state final four teams, of course, you know, it's a key component in the 95 team yeah. uh, that despite having a losing record and should have been put out, put out of their misery, went on to play in the final <laughs> four. Put down like a dog, as you said. That's right. Uh, hey, Bo Imley changed all that, right? <laughs> right. So yeah, just a, just a great player and uh, spanned, you know, spanned a, quite a 
quite a bit of time there at Baser as well. I mean, he was on the court for three plus years all the time. Uh, you know, you can hardly watch a game for three or four years there without seeing Bill. Well, yeah, I mean, he was right in the middle of the greatest run and he was present at the end of Empire sure. and he was present at the start of the Coach Sam era. And don't you're understating it. You had Bo on the Bo was another one where we had him on, we had him off, we had him on, we had him off. You had him on a lot more than I did. So Bo, Bo, oh, yeah. Bo, Bo was almost there. He's a top 25 guy, almost honorable mention for sure, as far as a Bayshore all time team. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Honorable mention, no doubt. And yeah, I mean, we were, we were wafting on him for a long time. He yeah. was right on the edge there. That's yeah. right. Right. So that's our honorable mentions. We've got 15 down in the top 25. We've got 10 to go. Let's jump into that real quick. Uh, the next guy is my guy. He's from uh, class of 2007. Uh, this guy, probably one of the most prolific scorers in school history. A uh, thousand point score and probably the minimum number of games you could play is 4,000 points. Uh, he had two 50 point games in senior year, averaged over 26 a game in senior year. Top five in the county of scoring in 2007, first team all county uh, in 2007. And uh, just basically, I mean, he was on Coach Pippen's uh, team in 2006, 2006, 2007. And, I mean, there's not really anything else to say about this guy. He could just light it up. Uh, and that's Daniel Martinez, class of 2007. Yeah, no doubt. Anybody who's saying that we did not recognize or pay attention to the 21st century guys isn't really paying attention to what we've done here. Martinez was a lights out. He was a volume scorer. He's one of the guys that you've got to get 20 shots or more a game uh, and you're going to have success if you get him that many shots. He was a volume scorer, which contributed greatly to those teams. There's several many eras before Broderick, Ikegi, Pippen, that are worth examination uh, just for the interesting way those teams sort of held on to the reputation. Maybe not added to it, but held it on, held on to it uh, until Broderick got there. So that's a good pick. I'm going to quickly name... The next two names, and I'll let you talk about one of them, and I'll talk about one of them. The next two names on the list are Albert Beckman and Damon Allen. I'll take Albert Beckman if you want to take Damon. Uh, That's great. Beckman, Beckman barely ekes out his teammate, Major Bloom. Major actually scored a point more per game than Beckman. But what was a separator for us was that Beckman had a higher icon status because he used to be in the stands screaming at the refs as a yeah. young kid. Uh, he famously got in trouble with Coach Valdez. Coach Rodas sends Joey Ruggieri out to pick him up. He refuses to get in the car. There's all kinds of famous stories. <laughs> That's not enough to be on the list. What separates him was not only would he have similar stats to Major, his teammate, and Dalvin Devine and Joe Place, but he was named first team to the all-county all-star team and then was the MVP of the county all-star game against all those public school guys. And then he played Division I basketball. People forget he signed with Warner Southern, changed his mind and walked on at Florida State, uh, did not uh, make, make the travel team or whatever at Florida State. So he transferred, ends up at University of Central Florida, playing Brian Peterson when UCF played Georgia. Two Bayshore guys going Division I head to head. Beckman was a Division I guy, MVP of the, all, of the county all-star game. Of course, he was all Bay Conference, honorable mention all county on one, one of the greatest teams of all time. So him, Major, and Dalvin are just like this. Those little points uh, of the All-Star game in college separated them. Beckman makes the top 25 all-time team. And if you have anything to add, please do. And then, of course, jump into Damon Allen. I'm going to go ahead and jump into the next guy, uh, class of 1997. Uh, this guy was one of those guys as well. He was there during transition period. Uh, he was with the 1995 team that made the Final Four run. He was all Bay Conference in 96, 97. Honorable mention all county in 96. First team all county in 97. Top 10 county, uh, top 10 in the county rebounding in 97. Uh, average a double double for points and rebounds in 97. Played on two district championships, one state final four. Uh, the leader of the 90, 1997 uh, Forgotten Kings. And uh, again, just uh, a double overtime away from probably being in the final four. If, not for the major upset by uh, Bradenton, and that's uh, Damon Allen. Uh, great guy, uh, great service member. We thank you for your service uh, and also for everything that you did at Bayshore. He's just a phenomenal guy. 
Uh, he's a strong preacher, and uh, he definitely is uh, worth mentioning here as, in our top 25. Uh, Steve? Ab absolutely. Damon Allen, I got to be very close with his father and Damon while he was in school, spent a lot of time with him. He is a Christian man, a an American patriot soldier, one of the great young men you could ever know, and gave us all for Bayshore. Played during the Coach Sam era, and you listed all the accolades. He is our 18th choice for the top 25 greatest players in Bayshore Christian history and a well-deserved addition to that team. So great job. That's correct. All right. So 18 down, seven to go. So now we're going to go into our, uh, our, 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 our reserves, I guess you will call them, on our top, top five team or uh, our sixth and seventh man. You, you can interchange them. One could be six, one could, two could be seven. Uh, what have you. Uh, Steve, do you want to go ahead with the next guy? Sure. And, ju and just to remind everyone, I know we're running long, but people, you can, I mean, you're, you're not watching. I mean, there's like, you know, there's a few people watching. You can watch it on YouTube and fast forward. So we're definitely going to make sure that we speak all of the accolades of these remaining seven guys. Uh, we're, we're 18 through uh, the 19th on the list for me, because I agree with you about the six man. Uh, the, the 19th guy is C.J. Cruz. He's a Division II college signee. Uh, he's played on three consecutive, I think two or three consecutive district championship teams. I can't remember if he was there as a sophomore, maybe not. You know, if Coach Day is watching, maybe he could type in and let us know. But, I mean, he was all Bay Conference. He was second team all county the year they went to the Final Four. He's first team all, or excuse me, uh, this year, first team all county last year first team all state, all final four team, high BCS icon status. Again, the Cruz name is sprinkled throughout Hillsborough County athletics, throughout the county, football and basketball, uh, top 10 county in scoring. You know, it, the list goes on and on. CJ Cruz, multiple top five and top 10 recognitions, uh, top five scorer, all county, C.J. Cruz could have easily broken the top five. And if you and I do this show 10 years from now, there might be a greater appreciation. I mean, he's just graduating as a senior this year. He might move up to the top five, um, but certainly top seven of the greatest players in Bayshore Christian history, C.J. Cruz. Absolutely. No doubt about it. I had the pleasure to see him play this year. Uh, just a dynamic player to watch. Uh, could do everything, could shoot from the outside, could drive, pick it up a dribble. Um, really enjoyed watching him play. Uh, his stats speak for themselves. Uh, I haven't heard a tally yet on how many points he finished up with, but I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up as Bayshore's all-time leading scorer, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, I'd love to get that number uh, from somebody who's got it out there. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, he's a four-year uh, varsity starter, played two years varsity for Strawberry Press, came up played two years varsity. Uh, for Bayshore, and the crew's name is just uh, known all around Hillsborough County Hoops, and just a phenomenal player, and we wish him the best of luck coming up uh, in his future college endeavors, right? That's right. Very good. So he's uh, our six, we'll call him 6B, or this one 6A, or he can reverse him or whatever. Uh, this guy for me is probably the uh, – the second best uh, big man in school history. Um, he is the all-time leading rebounder in school history. He was all Bay Conference. He was first team all county. Uh, he led the county in rebounding. Uh, he was top 10 in scoring in that same year. He ended up playing uh, for Florida College, where he, at that time he set the scoring record for Florida College, which was a two-year college back then. He ended up going to play for the University of Tampa, uh, where he was the only player to this date that I know of that as a sixth man was named uh, the postseason conference MVP. So think about that for a minute. The guy came off the bench and was MVP for the entire conference. Played professionally overseas. Good friend of mine. Um, yeah, other than, yeah, like I said, he's probably the second best big man I've ever seen. Uh, completely owned the boards, completely owned the blocks. And that's a class of 1998, Elijah Piazza. Woo! Yeah, no doubt. Uh, you know, we're down to the final grouping here. Elijah could just as easily be in that top five. Um, all of the accomplishments you listed, 
high icon metric at Bayshore with his father, uh, you know, who passed years ago. And, and of course we miss, and everyone loved Mr. Piazza and, that, and the Piazza family. His brother, Jared, who is worth a mention, and we, we forgot to mention him earlier, and we certainly should, played for four years, played during the Dibble Renaissance on a Final Four team. But sticking with Elijah, this is his moment. Six man can easily be top five. The one separating factor, of course, was that senior year for me uh, and the district title game and all those things that, that keep him off the top five. But he played professionally. Uh, he played Division II basketball, college signee, all of the dominant accolades you listed, one of the greatest basketball players in school history, well-deserving of not just six, but maybe even higher. Uh, we love Elijah. I miss getting to see him because I don't live in Tampa. I don't get to see all these guys. He's one of the greats, and you're exactly right. Uh, he certainly deserves uh, on this list. Absolutely. Just two more points I want to throw out there real quick about Elijah. He was actually he was a thousand point score for the school. Uh, and also, we talk, again, we talk about the war metric, the wins against replacement metric. Oh, yeah. If you take Elijah's team his senior year, uh, they had a losing record for sure. Uh, oh. So uh, definitely a lot of value added to a team uh, when you have Elijah on the floor. Absolutely. Steve, so we're, we're up next with our first guy, the top five. Let's get something else to say about those two guys. Yeah, we're down to the final five. Let me run through everybody we've listed so far, the 20 names so far. Reggie Sanford, John Harville, Andrew Polito, Joseph Rollins, J.J. Garnett, Kevin Noriega, Jojo Santiago, some guy by the name of Rodriguez, Fred Lewis, John Fielder, Freddie, Latin Locomotion Tomasello, Robbie Fiedo, John Blocker, T.J. Miller, Dion Brown, Albert Beckman, Daniel Martinez, Damon Allen, C.J. Cruz, and Elijah we just mentioned. We're now to the big five. It doesn't get any bigger than this. The, these names, this is not uh, just Mount Rushmore. This is the first team all time for Bayshore Christian in my book. Let me get all my notes in front of me. The first name on the top five players of all time is Derek Smith. The accolades, I mean, I mean, who doesn't know the, the numbers that go along with Derek Smith? All Bay Conference, 92-93. First team all county, 92-93. That's back when all classifications were together still. Honorable mention, All-State 1992, First Team All-State 1993, All-Final Four, First Team 1993, Top 15 in County Scoring 92-93, Signed Division One with Bethune-Cookman, High BCS Icon Status, High Hillsborough County Icon Status, his dad was the famed legendary coach Jimmy Smith, unanimous on all ballots. Uh, there is nothing that compares to the Showtime era at Bayshore Christian when Derek Smith and the guys massacred and humiliated every high school in its path from Jesuit, Tampa Catholic, Tampa Prep, to every public school, you name it. It was a beatdown of epic proportions and it started at the top was Mr. Smith himself. Currently the coach at Jefferson, he's the first on our first team all time, Derek Smith. Not really, not really a lot to say about Derek Smith after that, Steve. Other than the fact, that, I mean, yeah, he's absolutely Mr. Basher for several years there. Uh, he's the the, the the straw that stirred the drink <laughs> per se <laughs> uh, during that during those runs. I mean, you know, like you said, they killed everybody, and this was an era and a time where Basher uh, took on all comers. Okay, there was no watering on the schedule. It was put as many big teams on there as you can and punch him in the mouth. <laughs> right. and that's what Showtime did. Uh, you know, they took those guys and they just literally took it right at them. Beat teams like Tampa Catholic and Jesuit and Santa Fe Catholic and St. Pete Catholic and took it on the road and beat all kinds of public school teams all the time. Uh, probably definitely the highest. Uh, those two years with those guys, uh, definitely probably the high times for, for Bayshore, no doubt about it. And it was all led by Derek Smith, one point score for the school. Absolutely. So, uh, I think we're doing our list backwards, so you should be next, right? Uh, well, I think this next guy is your guy. <laughs> well, I can go ahead and do the next one because I definitely want to make sure that you get your guy at the end. So the next one I got, we're going back to the original gangster era. John Harville said this is the foundational rock 
of the Herman Valdez dynasty of Bayshore Christian. Uh, and it is, because he is an OG. There was a picture of him on Facebook recently <laughs> uh, where we had the Coach Valdez dinner. Y'all were down there in Tampa at Carmine's in Ybor City. And uh, somebody said, JD is the blank. It's an expletive. And uh, it had a picture of him. It looked like it was out of a mafia movie. Uh, that's how <laughs> hardcore. It, it, it's just, it's, we, we should not even say anything. Let's just drop the mic and walk off right now because this is John JD <laughs> Edwards. Uh, Edwards was an original yeah. OG. He's, he's Mount Rushmore as far as I'm concerned. He was second team all state in 1984, honorable mention all state in 1985, led the county in assists in both 1984 and 1985. He was a double double in assists and points per game in both 1984 and 85. He played on a district champion, went to the final four in 1984, and a Bay Conference champion in 85. All Bay Conference, 83, 84, 85. All County Honorable Mention, 1983 and 1985. I think I meant to put 84. Oh, no, because second team All County, 1984. Uh, he signed with, he had, a, he had a different places. It was Tusculum College and Florida College. and ended up at Trinity College, NAIA in Chicago, where he literally became friends with a, with uh, guys that were hanging out with Michael Jordan, got an NBA contract for a free agent contract with the Bulls. His time with Jordan led to a whole bunch of Jordan, giving him a whole bunch of swag to sell at the Bayshore uh, auction that they have each year. Um, as Chantel, uh, my fellow classmate from 1986 said on Facebook, JD is the blank because he is the original gangster, drop mic, stop the discussion, Mount Rushmore, J.D. Edwards. You're next, Chris. <laughs> you just dropped the mic, man. <laughs> There's nothing else to be said. And J.D., I mean, in all, in, all, in all honesty, may be the greatest Bayshore basketball player ever, and that's saying a lot. Uh, these are the two guys, phenomenal players and athletes, but uh, I don't know, man. J.D. was something special, man. Uh, you know, it's just and then this is story to follow. I mean, what is he actually selling out of that bakery up there in Dade City? You know, is it, <laughs> is it baked goods or who knows, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, just going to Chicago and then, those, you know, having those 10-day uh, contracts with the Bulls, you know, over, over and over again. And, you know, he was telling a story one time about being in an office and the guy, these guys, obviously, he's then walked out and the phone rings, he picks it up. He says, hey, tell so and so Michael Jordan called. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, right? That's so anyway, exactly. you know, but from a purely player standpoint, I mean, you heard the accolades, you know, for three years, he dominated the Bay Shore scene, dominated the Bay Conference scene, uh, dominated the 1A scene, and dominated the, the county in a lot of respects. Uh, so, yeah, definitely worthy of the top five, if not Mount Rushmore, if not the best player in Bay Shore. Uh, Very, John good. Very good. Very good. Are you Who up? we got here? Who we got? Who we got? Who we got? All right. So the next guy we got up uh, was it's, it's hard to even describe this guy. Uh, he was a phenomenal player. Uh, he was all big conference three years in a row. He was honorable mention all county one year. The next year, his first team all county. He was first team all state. He was on the all final four team in 1994. When he Retired when he left high school, he was the all time leading three point shooter in the state of Florida. Okay, we're not talking about not talking about the school, we're not talking about the, the county, we're talking about the state of Florida. He was the all time leading three point shooter. Uh, he was the, so obviously that makes him the all time three leading three point shooter in the county. Uh, he was number one in the scoring in the Hillsborough County in 1994, top 15 in rebounding in '93. Uh, huge, huge and iconic moments and iconic games. Uh, scored 40 points in a win against a tough 2A4 meet team. Mm -hmm. uh, he's top five in the county in free throw shooting. All time leading scorer in Bayshore history, uh, as far as we know, until we get the final numbers from CJ Cruz. Um, just one of those guys that could just do it all. Um, he was a 6'4 uh, small forward that shot like a shooting guard and really there was, wasn't anything he could do on a court uh played with him in some alumni games later on in the years and i've never seen a guy with a pure shot uh, than this guy let team uh, let bay short to their best teams probably in history other than the 1987 team and that's jonathan johnson Woo! 
I mean, th this list is, I mean, if you took these five guys and played any other high school's top five guys, we're going to be in the game if not win it. I mean, Jonathan Johnson, like you said, he was the all-time leading three-point shooter for until Teddy Dupay at Cape Coral Mariner broke the record in the early 2000s. But he's probably still top five or top seven three-point shooter all time. He averaged 30 points oh, yeah. a game his senior year. And I remember, I think he started 92, 93, 94. And on 93, the Derek and Andrick Showtime, he's the one that scored 27 points in the district title game to make sure we advanced. Uh, Jonathan Johnson was unbelievable. Yeah. And Coach Valdez speaks so highly of yep. Jonathan Johnson's work ethic. No one was in the gym more practicing at his craft. And he went from, and I think he ended up a little bit taller, maybe 6'5 or 6'6". Six, six. He, he went from a center, a five-man, as you had described, to a guard, a, a three-point shooting guard at that height. No one matched up with us on the wing. Who were you going to put on him? A big couldn't guard him and a little guy he would shoot over. It was the ultimate mismatch that you never, that you didn't see until – late 90s early 2000s when we had positionless three-point shooting basketball he was the first yeah. and he was one of the greatest in the, in the city's history he's one of the top five mount rushmore guys in Bayshore's history great great pick absolutely so am i up next right, i think okay. you're up yeah um the last two guys i mean when we list all these accolades i mean it goes on and on and on as you get longer in the list there are two guys that have the most accolades. The most accolades you're going to list last, and I'm going to miss it, list the guy who had the second most accolades, and that's Brian Peterson. Number one, the Peterson name is Bayshore Royalty. He had been there before ninth grade. I've told the story in previous podcasts, walk in the gym, I asked Coach Dibble, who's that little guy? And he said, you stick around and watch, is what Tom said. And as an eighth grader, getting ready to go into ninth grade, I think for your year, whatever, he was simply dominant in open gym. Uh, Brian Peterson would go on to play division one at the University of Georgia. He is of course, from the beginning, the Mount Rushmore of all of our Facebook alumni uh, consideration of all these great players. And just, I mean, listen to the accolades, all Bay Conference, uh, 1989, 90 and 91, honorable mention all county in 1990, First team all county 1991, honorable mention all state 1990, first team all state 1991, first team all final four team 1991, represented Florida on the junior national team touring the former Soviet Union, uh, signed division one with the University of Georgia, not division one at the University of South Dakota or Cal State Fullerton or the University of Georgia, he signed division one. Uh, iconic performances head-to-head -head in defeating future Florida State quarterback Danny Cannell in that famous two games we listed, the top 10 games of all time, down in Broward County. Scored 26 against Broward Christian. Dalvin Devine hits the game winner. Then he scores nine in overtime and has 31, outscoring Danny Cannell and beating number one ranked Fort Lauderdale Westminster, which ultimately led to us being number, ranked number one. Uh, he, led the, he was top 10 in the county in scoring both 1990 91. I mean, do, I mean, this is another drop mic moment. I mean, it's embarrassing we even have to list it because this is one of the greatest basketball players in the history of the city of Tampa, much less our school. Brian Peterson is on this list, our 24th name, top 25 greatest players of all time. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Definitely Mount Rushmore. Um, if, if, if but for the fact that he wasn't such a quiet guy, he may be, such a he nice may be even man. more notorious. You know, he's such a quiet guy that people don't even know sometimes uh, recognize what a great player he was, you know. And I guess even back then, he wasn't uh, the most boisterous guy on the, on the court, uh, but he certainly let his uh, scoring and his basketball skills do the talking, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've got 24 down. We've got one left. Um, wow. So the last four that we mentioned, I mean, just phenomenal players, you know, how you rank them one through five, it's almost impossible. Uh, all five of these guys are just phenomenal. Uh, this guy here, in my opinion, is, is the best basketball player to ever play uh, in Bayshore history. He's definitely in the top five. Uh, if we were ranking him one through five, he'd be my number one, but we're not doing that. So, 
Um, he was a first team all state member. He was a first team all county. He was a first team all final four. He was class 1A player of the year, all Bay Conference. He was MVP of the county all star game. Uh, he recorded 36 points in the county all star game. Uh, and again, that's in the all-star game was everybody in the county he wasn't broken up into classifications. It was everyone. That's right. Uh, Tampa, Tri Tampa Tribune Player of the Year, Tampa Tribune Athlete of the Year. Uh, third, scored 33 points and had 15 rebounds in the state championship game. Again, to, to date, only one of two Bayshore teams to make it to the state championship game. Uh, he was top five in the county in scoring, top five in the county in rebounding. Uh, he won... We won districts, we won Bay Cons, we won regionals, we won sectionals. We won the semifinals for the state. He was a signee uh, with, that, with Southeastern Louisiana, Division I, out of, out of high school. Transferred to Division I, Florida A&M University after that. Had a 30-point game while playing for the Fanny Rattlers. Um, he was famous for breaking backboards at basketball camps. <laughs> He uh, was an NBA summer league contractor. He played professionally in France for a short period of time. And uh, he's the most highly decorated player in school and perhaps county history. Uh, my good friend, um, my teammate, and uh, someone I, I look up to immensely even to this day for all he, that, he, that he does even to this day. And uh, that's Kelvin Daniels. Steve? <laughs> Absolutely. And as we've mentioned in the previous podcast that we had with Kelvin, you know, the, the Kelvin and his brother, Kevin, we go back. Uh, I've been friends with them since elementary school at church, Sunday school. We've all been friends with them for years through the branding connection before Bayshore. And then, of course, Bayshore. 30 years, we don't see him. You think with the Internet, we could find him. But he's a head honcho, F-35 program, Lockheed Martin. So how are you going to find somebody who's probably got a national security clearance, whatever? Uh, family man, Christian man, uh, took the time to fly. Once we, once you found him, you and Fred found him, took the time to fly in for that alumni event at Fat Willie's a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but you said it all. There was one accolade I don't think I typed up that I found the other day. He was also the Tampa Bay Coaches Association Player of the Year. So Tribune Player of the Year, Athlete of the Year, 1A Player of the Year, Sports Writer. Never has there been a player like that in Hillsborough County history. I mean, there's not, I mean, Tony Mack, I guess, did he have as many accolades as Kelvin? Uh, so one of the greats of all time uh, in, in basketball history in Florida, and certainly one of the greatest of all time, top 25 at Bayshore. So uh, I wanted to make sure that you got to say that about your teammate and great friend. Uh, so you closed it out. This has been an yeah. unbelievable evening. I know a lot of people who've gone long, we're almost at two hours. So we apologize that it went this long. Maybe we should add two episodes. But, you know, <laughs> we're not going to do this much longer. We got one season left. You may not be around for a lot of it. This was the show we wanted to do. We didn't rush through it. We want to make sure that we got all of these famous people's names properly accounted for. And we spoke very highly of them because their performances on behalf of our school deserved that we recognize them. So we apologize we went long, but I'm glad we did it. Uh, yeah, I'm just so, so thankful that we come from a long lineage of uh, basketball success. Um, it's not just basketball either. I mean, uh, it's about friendships and camaraderie and, uh, you know, heck, I mean, our volleyball programs have been phenomenal at that school. The academics are unparalleled. Uh, so many students end up going to Division I and Ivy League schools. And uh, just in general, I mean, these guys are representative of what Bayshore means, and, that's, and that is to success to, – excel in whatever your given uh, profession or chosen avenue is. So uh, we appreciate every one of these guys that's on this list. Um, they all gave their heart and soul at one time or another uh, for Bayshore to succeed. And we sure appreciate that. And we're just, like Steve said, happy to recognize them. Yeah, last word I'll say, uh, the Valdez era comes out with the most players. Sam and Dibble have a good amount but we properly accounted for the 21st century and we did it without any help from anybody. Like we would beg people to tell us who were good players, whatever. So just re we're, I'm repeating myself and I, I, we're not going to relist the top 25. We'll put it on Facebook. So we don't spend any more time of your time that watched. Thank you for those that checked in. Uh, 
we are sure that this is a great list and we believe that we did our best in making sure we recognize all these great players. That'll be the last thing I say. Thank you everyone for watching and Chris, you can have the last word. Thank you, Ann. Good night. <laughs>